Welcome to the story of Napoleon's hat. Or, how the Jewish state was nearly created in Palestine 100 years before Herzl. The year is 1799. The French general, Napoleon Bonaparte, on his way to becoming Emperor of France, successfully leads his army in the bloody conquest of Cairo. He next pushes north from El Arish, capturing Gaza and then the major port of Jaffa in the Ottoman region then known as Palestine. After a victorious siege, Napoleon's troops slaughtered between 2,000 and 4,000 of Jaffa's Turkish defenders. Word spreads throughout the region about the vicious practices of the French troops under Napoleon. This emboldens him to seek his main objective, which is the capture of Jerusalem. Napoleon next issues a proclamation in Jaffa directed to the impoverished Jews of Jerusalem. It is an eloquent call to arms, inviting the Jews to rise up and to help the French conquer the Holy City. Napoleon promises that once he has vanquished the Turks, he and his troops will return to France, leaving Jerusalem in the hands of the Jews. He encourages them to establish a Jewish nation. Some excerpts from the proclamation. It starts out, letter to the Jewish nation from the French commander-in-chief Bonaparte. You are the rightful heirs of Palestine. France offers to you at this very time and contrary to all expectations, Israel's patrimony. Rightful heirs of Palestine, he calls them. Arise, show that the might of your oppressors has only repressed the courage of the descendants of the Maccabees. But the 2,000 years of treatment as slaves have not succeeded in stifling it. Hasten, now is the moment which may not return for thousands of years to claim the restoration of civic rights among the population. Very stirring. Naturally, the Jews of Jerusalem are overjoyed at the news. Toda Rama. And they asked, Merci beaucoup, General Bonaparte. When may we expect you to liberate Jerusalem and restore our homeland? Mm, not long, but first I have to secure the coast, and that means conquering Accra. A few days, mm, two weeks tops. And off he goes to conquer the seaport of Accra. Napoleon and his 13,000 infantry marched further north into what was then Syria and laid the port city of Accra under siege. They anticipated a quick victory. But there he faced an enemy even more ferocious than himself, the Ottoman governor of Sidon and Damascus, known as Jazar Pasha or Jazar the Butcher. Jazar knew that his soldiers were terrified of the French after hearing about the slaughter in Jaffa. So Jazar turned to his closest confidant and most trusted advisor, his treasury manager, a Damascan Jew named Haim Farhi. There he is. Although Jazar in the past had been displeased with Haim and had his ear and nose cut off and one of his eyes gouged out. But at this point in time, Haim and Jazar were on good terms. Some historians have suggested the reason Napoleon issued the proclamation to the Jews was to persuade Farhi to betray Jazar and to take sides with the French. But if this was a tactic, it did not work. Farhi gave Jazar Pasha some very sound advice. And here it is. Oh, great and white Saib, we all know that the English hate the French. I recommend you find a British admiral who despises Napoleon and convince him to help us defend Accra. 
Well, they found one. Yeah, they found a doozy. Sir Sidney Smith, who was a flamboyant British Royal Admiral who had served in the American and French Revolutionary Wars. There he is. Six years earlier, a young French artillery colonel named Napoleon Bonaparte had defeated and humiliated Smith at the Battle of Toulon. Smith held a grudge ever since. He could not wait to join the fray and extract vengeance against the little general. Of course, we'll help you defend your city against the French. I've got a bone to pick with Bonaparte. And the battle ensued, and it raged, and it was vicious, and it was long, and it was bloody. Smith provided cannon fire from his fleet of ships along the coast that made it impossible to keep the French troops supplied. He reinforced the walls of the city. He provided troops that enabled the Ottoman defenders to hold off the French siege. A battle that was expected to take two days waged on for nearly two months. Finally, Napoleon realized that due to Smith's intervention, he could not defeat Jazar. By the battle's end, a dejected Napoleon approached one of his cannon squads. Attention, mes soldats de cannon. Here is mon champon. Shoot it into Acre with your cannon. If I cannot enter the city, at least my hat will have made it. After this stunning defeat at the hands of the British reinforced Ottomans, Napoleon abandoned his troops and rushed back to France alone. Also abandoned was his dream of conquering Jerusalem and restoring it as a Jewish homeland. Of his nemesis, Sir Sidney Smith, Napoleon said many times, that man made me miss my destiny. And not to mention the destiny of the Jewish people who, had Napoleon succeeded, would have been able to redeem their ancient homeland nearly a century before Herzl and Zionism came along. One of the mysteries of history is this. Would Napoleon have kept his word had he succeeded in conquering Jerusalem? Would he truly have turned over the sovereignty of Palestine to the small population of Jews living there? Or was the proclamation merely propaganda designed to win friends and influence Jews to throw in with France? We shall never know. But to get an idea of Napoleon's feelings about Jews, we do know this much. Two years before the Battle of Acre, Napoleon's army had just occupied the Italian seaport of Ancona. He was amazed when he saw some people wearing yellow bonnets and armbands on which was the Star of David. He asked some of his officers why these people were wearing the bonnet and the armbands and what was its purpose. When Napoleon was told they were Jews and they had to be identified so they could return to the ghetto in the evening, he immediately gave an order that they should remove the yellow bonnet and armbands. He then authorized the closing of the ghetto and allowed the Jews to live wherever they wanted and to practice their religion openly. The following year, in 1798, he did the same when his troops succeeded in occupying Malta. In 1805, after his ascent to power in France, Napoleon emancipated the nation's Jews, providing them with full civil rights. Jews, under Napoleon's civil code, were free to live where they chose, worship as they please, and able to vote, pay taxes, and serve in the military for the first time. So it appears that Napoleon was sincere in the proclamation of 1799, and that were it not for the intervention of a vengeful Englishman, he would have fulfilled his promise of creating a Jewish homeland in Palestine 98 years before Herzl's first World Zionist Conference. The lesson? Let's fast forward 148 years. The year 1947. In November, the United Nations voted to accept the partition of Palestine, thereby creating the modern state of Israel. 
Zionist leader Chaim Weizmann, who would serve as Israel's first president, stated at the time, the state will not be given to the Jewish people on a silver platter. Seventy years of war and struggle proved him to be correct. No one other than the Jews can give the Jews a state. Not the British, not the UN, and not even Napoleon Bonaparte.